Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Cantava on Mix 94.7 FM. I hope that you guys have been having a great day and a great week so far. Um, as stated er- much earlier, you know, when, when starting out this program, uh, one of the key things I definitely love to do and want and will continue to do is to highlight our professionals here in St. Martin. Um, again, you know, we have so many professionals who... Uh, have returned home, you know, um, to our beloved country. Uh, many who had had opportunity or could have stayed away, but decided, you know, to do the heavy lifting, of come back home and dealing with all sorts of challenges, but still making a difference, ma- making their mark wherever possible. And um, you know, I've had artists, uh, persons from the political field, um, but today uh, I have here with me a lawyer, uh, Miss Natalie Tacklin. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming on the program. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. So before we begin, I guess, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to get into the field of law? Oh, tough one. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I grew up here. I, you know, went through school here. Um, I, I want to say born and raised, but I wasn't born here. I was born in Aruba, but uh, okay. I always lived here in St. Martin. I think my parents lived here when I was born, you know. Um, but, you know, I think all going through, I was at MPC, I was in Feuillo, and um and I think for me, I remember always kind of being good in all the fields in school. So it was a really hard choice that I thought, like, oh, do I want to go into the sciences? Or, you know, do I want to go into more something that's uh, more debate skills? Or mm-hmm. I couldn't see myself being an economist, you know? So yeah. it was kind of, you know, that back and forth. And I think I went through a lot of different uh, ideas of things that I wanted to do. And eventually, I think just before I went to college, I kind of settled on, hey, I think maybe I do want to go into to law and, you know, apply myself in, in that field. And uh, and that's kind of how that that happened. You know, I think I, I did a lot of uh, debates and things like that uh, while we were in high school at mm-hmm. MPC. And uh and somehow it just seemed like something that Before, fit yeah. in terms of all the different types of things that I like to do in terms of, you know, uh, analytical skills and, and problem solving skills and all these things kind of come together, I think, beautifully in the field of law. Indeed. So that's uh, kind of how that happened. And were you always a reader growing up? Yeah, I was I was a big reader. It's, uh, it's funny, I remember like in fourth grade or something at one point, I got a six for behavior. My mom asked the teacher, you know, why did not get a, a six? And uh, apparently I was reading books in the middle of class. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so, I, I mean, no, but yeah, it was always... I guess better than reading. talking in the middle of class, right? I guess it is better, you know, <laughs> I guess it depends on, uh, on what your stance is <laughs> on either of those, but mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, great. And so I saw that um, when you went to study law, you studied European law at Massac University. Mm-hmm. Uh, how was that? And uh, can you... I guess, um, share with us, what was your um, study abroad experience like? Yeah, um, in terms of, yeah, so European law, it's European law school in Maastricht. Um, They're, you know, the best place in in the Netherlands to study something like that. Their program is very highly ranked. Um, But the nice thing I liked about it was that it was a mix of, you get the same Dutch law bachelors that you have to get normally in order to get your civil effect, which is what you need to be a practicing attorney. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, you also get that supplemented with all these European law courses that were in English. So I thought that that was nice because at least I got to do something that wasn't completely Dutch. Because I think, too, talking about the experience of studying abroad, um, I spoke f- very fairly good Dutch when I went to the Netherlands already. Mm-hmm. And um, But, you know, legal Dutch and reading that is a completely different ballgame. And so that was challenging. Uh, but you, you get used to it, I think, mm-hmm. as you, know, you, you get into, uh, into studying. But besides that, uh, what I really liked was just ha- being able to read a book in English and to apply that in a different field of law. And so I thought European law was really interesting. And at least uh, there, w- there was a combined program. It was a bit more work, but there was that combination. Yeah. Well, um, studying law is, of course, not easy. Not an <laughs> easy study. Uh, it's almost up there with being a doctor or surgeon, I, w- I, w- I would say. <laughs> um, but for you, how was it like you know, committing yourself to your studies and what would you say were the key skills that, you know, you've sharpened to help you excel in your career? Oof, um, those are those are tough ones. And I think I've seen a development in uh, in the way you need to apply certain skills, I think, dependent on, on where you go to school, you know, because I studied in the Netherlands, but I also studied in the U.S., which maybe we'll get to in a bit. Mm-hmm. But comparing law school in the Netherlands to law school in the United States, completely different. And um, I feel like I almost wasn't really prepared for how it was in the U.S. when I went there. 
just because, you know, in Holland, you have shorter, we had blocks. So you had a class that ran maybe six, seven weeks. And, you know, you got all the material in that time. And then it was an exam in the seventh week. So it wasn't a ton of material. Mm. So even for someone that's that I would leave things a bit to the last minute, especially when you're when you're younger, um, it, you were there was enough time for me to kind of cram it in the couple of days more before the exam. So it was more manageable, I think, in that sense. I don't recommend it. Yeah, of course. In hindsight, <laughs> but you know, for me, it did work at that time. But mm-hmm. then you go to the U.S. and I th- you've studied in the U.S., so I think you can make the comparison. But your the amount of material that you have to read just in one day for a lecture is immense, mm-hmm. and you're reading, you know, a hundred pages per day per class. And you, if you don't keep up with that along the way, there's no way that you'll be ready for the exam by the time that time comes around. Mm-hmm. So I think that th- those were essential. So I think in that sense, and even now in my in my professional career, I think time management is is very important. Yeah, you know, in order to be able to to structure yourself and to get to hit your deadlines, especially working as a lawyer, your clients have expectations. Um, you know, if you're doing court documents, you have deadlines in terms of the the period of time that you have to submit a document to court. So it can't be that you can just keep asking for extensions. So I think, um, and of course, you have multiple things that you're juggling at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I think um, I think time management has been essential <laughs> for. Oh, really? um, for all of those. And what do you say? You were always an organized person or, or, or it, uh, or the process kind of I, it, I grew put into you in it. Check. I grew into it a lot. Okay. Um, I think for me, I've seen uh, even throughout my professional career that, you know, I've gotten much better at, at creating structure for myself because, you know, I think you can get away with a lot of things as a student, but then you start to work and <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, the stress is a different type of stress as well, but... I think over time, I think we like I've. I think you find what works for you, and you know I've been able to experiment and, and grow and, and find you know how I can be most efficient, and uh, you know I think even going from, for example, when you're a student, you think like oh I can study late at night, and uh, and that's fine, but. Um, you know, once you start to work, you can't be working until two, three in the morning because yeah. you have to be at work again at yeah. eight. Yeah. So you have to find, you know, how you can find that efficiency and, and that way of working that you can actually focus. So I think that that's something that I think you need to play around with over time. Mm-hmm. And so what was your motivation in uh, studying in the U.S.? Uh, you studied at George Washington, mm-hmm. um, especially coming from a, a Dutch background. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a it's a fairly uh, easy story. I mean, uh, I was I remember I had in Holland your bachelor's is like three years, and then you do you do a master's in one year. I took some time in between my bachelor's and my master's and did an internship in the U.S. Mm. just to kind of kill time. But then I, my dad was like, okay, time to go back to school. So I went back to school and um, I was there for seven months. I came back and. I still kind of had this feeling of, oh, wow, I'm going to be finished studying really soon (laughs) and then I have to go to work. Uh, But but I mean, think more importantly than that, I was in my master's and it was towards the end, I think midway, I had a course in intellectual property law and I found it so interesting that I was like, I'm going to write my thesis about this. I, I loved it. And, um, and from there I thought I actually, this is something that I would love to learn more about. So in that time, that I had in my master's, I decided to apply to, pro- to, I looked into intellectual property programs in the United States and um, and I applied to just, you know, whatever the best schools were. And then I went to the one that was ranked the highest. Yeah. And then, and G- George Washington was ranked number three in the United States for intellectual property. So I ended up going there. And um, so that was kind of how that was. I think it was born out of this I was really cu- I had this intellectual curiosity to to learn more about their legal system because mm-hmm. I had had common law courses I had had this intellectual property course and and I thought like this seems really interesting and um, and then I also just this opportunity to kind of delay <laughs> graduation a little bit longer and uh, so that's how I ended up there. Yeah, um, post that 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 uh, that uh, period you know of realizing hey you officially done you got to go into the real world <laughs> yeah. is you know it, it hits hard it's tough yeah yeah uh which is my next question which um is what was it like you know for you officially starting you know starting in the real world uh and which case which cases do you which cases that you've worked on that still stand out to you Ooh, um i uh, I think well, if one getting coming into working was 
I think nothing really prepares you for that. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you have to, they teach you things, they teach you kind of the basics in law school, but they don't teach you how to be a lawyer. Yeah. So they, I do feel like there's a little bit of that disconnect. So, you know, and, and it's also just having to be an adult. And so there's, th- I think those, there's those growing pains. Um, but I think some of the more, the, the cases I think that I've worked on that still stand out to me are probably in my second and third year here that there were like more constitutional issues that had to do more with things that were going on between the Netherlands and St. Martin and advising on, you know, how does the country deal with those um, really specific matters without, you know, going into to too much detail. Yeah, gotcha. But, um, but I do appreciate because still, you know, times like even you're working on legislation, you're seeing all these things come up, you know, eight, you know, eight years later or something like that. But they're still really relevant and you can remember working on them before. So I find um, those always to be to be really fun. I think, you know, advising government and kind of on these more complicated matters. I think those are, are some of the fun ones that stand out to me. Interesting uh, to say fun. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they're, they're, they're high stress, but they're, yeah. they're also pretty fun. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, and I think even just like simple things as, you know, working on, you know, I did some corporate work as well. So when you work on a huge financing deal where a company just happens to have daughter companies in Curacao or wherever you're working and advising on, but that, you know, you can read about it in the international news because it's a deal going on in Europe and, yeah. you know, or things that you're every time now that I see certain companies, I'm like, oh yeah, I worked on that. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, those are the ones that, that stand out. A little bit more for me. Uh, so, what was your motivation for uh, doing both corporate and legislative law? Did you, I guess did you want to ensure that you could touch on both public and private sector, mm-hmm. or you ever saw yourself focusing on uh, one area? Yeah, you know, I think that grew organically, uh, okay. honestly, because um, you know I had a, a background that was, I, you know, I studied trade and company law in school, and then you know I came here, I kind of did that, but I had worked for three years as an attorney here, and. And I thought to myself, oh, I don't know if I'm, I'm if I'm happy or this is where I want my life to be, if this is the life I want in, in 10 years or however long. And from there, I think coincidentally, I had kind of run in, come into finding someone had just been leaving from the council advice that I knew. And she was like, hey, would this be something you were interested in? And it was something I had never really thought much about. Coincidentally, a couple months before that, as part of the job that I was at, they were doing legislative work for clients mm. on different islands. So they had sent maybe two or three of us to um, to a course. And so we took a course in legislative writing. So And uh, from doing that, I thought, oh, this is really interesting that I had done that course. And then I, so I think it all kind of came together at the same time. And then I ended up at the council where, of course, you know, we advise on legislation mm-hmm. and and I got a little bit more familiar with, you know, how to draft, you know, laws and, and things like that. So... I, I think I could that kind of you know I, f- I fell into that and I ended up really liking it and it's something that even now like I'm, I'm very it's a big part of the practice I have now. Yeah, and it is and a great need because um, you know uh, you often particularly hear uh, parliamentarians mention that is a need for sure that they 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 yeah. require um, so as legislative lawyers. Yeah. Um, and also uh, even as you mentioned being part of the council advice, I guess what came to mind is what do you consider you know when when uh, drafting or amending a law yeah. before, before a law actually goes into effect, what are the things you, you consider? Yeah. Um, so at the Council of Advice, for example, um, the test, it's kind of a three-pronged test that's carried out. The first one being, you know, looking at whether something has any conflict with any other legislation that's of a higher hierarchy or higher order. And then the other part is kind of this policy assessment, looking at, you know, well, what are the issues that we want to fix? And I think that, that that's one locally that... I think where we struggle and, and in terms of us feeling like we need laws or, 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 or different things, that we feel like we need to legislate everything. And I don't think necessarily that everything needs legislation. Mm. Or sometimes if you have an idea of it, I think it's important to have to identify, you know, what is the problem and what is the means of solving this problem and not conflating the means with the actual goal. And so you do kind of notice that it's hard for, for us to, to separate those things sometimes, um, especially, you know, just listening to parliament. You know, um, not all problems require a legislative change. And I think so those are the things that you look at, too, in that policy assessment and looking at, well, what is the like, efficacy of, of actually implementing this law? Can it be carried out? You know, we can say, 
uh, we can implement something and that requires a ton of police assistance, but we don't have enough police officers. Mm -hmm. And if you're if, if you won't be able to enforce the law, then no one's going to respect the law. Correct. So there, those are all kind of all things that you consider when uh, when when looking at, at one that's a draft that's come to you. But I think also important to consider when you as a parliamentarian, as, as a minister, as a policy advisor, anybody within government looking to, to draft legislation, I think it's important for you to make that initial assessment of, okay, what do we actually want to fix? Mm -hmm. And um, and is this the most effective way to do that? Gotcha. So. Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that come to mind is um, basically your thesis that you did, which was um, <laughs> the constitutional future of Nenas Antilles. Ah. I was like, I wrote two, but okay, yeah. Sorry? I wrote two. That was my bachelor thesis. Yeah, well, sorry. Yeah, yeah so that was yeah. your bachelor thesis yeah. specifically. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was on the DNA mm -hmm. and its role yeah. in copyright. That's, that's the nerd in me. Yeah. <laughs> Which I want to touch yeah. on as well. Uh, but for that, you know, um, and not to put you on the spot really, mm -hmm. but, but looking at, you know, the, the work you that you did there, looking at how our system of change, of course, uh, what do you think can be done to... Um, improve our system that we mm -hmm. have um, you know, as a, as a, as a quote-unquote new country? Yeah. Um, the thesis at the time, I think I wrote it in 2009, off the top of my head, that probably would have been the time, and it was pre-101010, and it was on the constitutional future of the best islands. So it was uh, Bonaire, Seba, gotcha. and, and Stacia, just because, you know, that was a bit more interesting mm -hmm. than what, uh, from a constitutional law perspective, than what Something was happening new. to, to yeah, Aruba, gotcha. or to St. Martin and Curacao. Yeah. Um, but, I think uh, in terms of uh, St. Martin and what I think we c what can be different, I, it's tough. I think it's it's the growing pains, I think, of, of any new country. And um, and it, there is, I think, a level of, of maturity that we need um, to solve certain to solve certain things. Um, you know, we can maybe controversial to say, but, you know, we talk about uh, reform of, you know, like we, uh, of our voting or the way, what electoral is it? Reform. Electoral reform. Mm -hmm. We talk about electoral reform, but the question is how much of that, from a legislative perspective, from a legal perspective, how much of that needs to be legislated and how much of it is human behavior. Gotcha. And so I, I, I do wonder with a lot of, you know, how can we be better? I don't know how much of that needs to be a legal question. Yeah. I More so, we, we uh, need to look like inward, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I got you. No, because it's like, uh, for example, when we would often say, you know, you look at parliament and ways parliament can improve and um, you you can add more stuff to the rule to the rule book, but how much of it is really, well, you know, MP as an MP, let's say you can't make certain statements. Mm -hmm. Do you have to write that or do you, should you just yeah. trust that, you know, as a member of parliament, you wouldn't uh, behave in a certain manner or yeah. say certain things? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing is too, even from a legal perspective, you want to give legislation space to, to grow and to breathe. Hmm. You don't want something to be so rigid that every time something comes up, it needs changing because it doesn't it doesn't fit gotcha. into that, that situation. I mean, we look at something. rebel as well too, so. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you look at a document like the, the Charter of the Kingdom, which was drafted in 1954. It's mm -hmm. not a very big document, but we've still had it since 1954 and, yep. it, and it works. There's an answer for most things, whether or not people like the answer, that's a different question. But but the document itself, it allows for, for these changes. And of course, we're always going to get matters of interpretation as, as lawyers, but that, that's why, you know, that's why we have a profession. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, <laughs> pack us up. But, but, you know, I think when you, when you make legislation overly rigid, then it, it'll give you even more issues and it won't allow you to kind of grow and to, and to expand within that framework. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So uh, even as you mentioned, well, so as we, we spoke on uh, your first thesis, the second mm -hmm. one, uh, when I read it, it was like, pretty interesting, um, the role of... Um, so it was kind about, of chopping it was about the DNA and, and your likeness, right? It was about patenting uh, human genes and DNA. Yeah. So, so yeah. Well, for, for clarity's sake, patenting and, and copyright, same thing or not? Different. Yeah, also. different thing. So a patent is, you know, a process or, or something that you own. Um, a copyright is basically any written word, any products of the mind, you know. So um, that's usually how the distinction is. And then patenting is also a very deep ownership. You know, like, for example, even drugs or chemical, like drugs, I mean, pharmaceuticals. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those are all patented formulas, uh, things like that, you know, you're able to protect over a longer time. Um and in this case, it would be like your human, ge your own genes and, and things like that. So um, here, kind of the, the impetus for, for that thesis was at the time, there was a lot of um, litigation and a lot of discussion about the, um, the BRCA gene, which is the breast cancer gene. And the breast cancer gene was patented by 
Myriad Technologies, which was this one, you know, big uh, biotech company. And then the question was, you know, can they own, you know, this this gene that is present in people and also then at the same time making it so difficult for women to get tested because mm-hmm. the testing was so overly expensive and it can only be done through them or through labs that had licensed the technology from them. So you got into all this thing of, well, can we really, you know, be patenting things like that? I but some, you one tells you mm-hmm. that you or that they own a part of your body. Yeah, basically. And uh, so that that was it was very interesting at the time. I haven't done anything else with it since. <laughs> but um <laughs> But yeah, I, but I see, I see why it. I see why you why you went yeah. that direction. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, so it is a really interesting subject matter, and uh, I think even there, if you listen to some of the Supreme Court arguments uh, in the end of this case, which happened after I had pub- after I had finished it, mm-hmm. um, you do get really interesting, like crazy analogies about okay, but if it's you know if I have a baseball bat and uh, somebody patents a tree, or does do they then want, you know? So it's just <laughs> yeah, all these uh, different things. But and but as far as your, your likeness though, um, I guess that that's the most simple process, right? Uh, well, your your likeness, I think, then you get into more questions, too, of even... It does, I think, your likeness goes into a bit of a copyright mm-hmm. issue as well. Um, yeah, as, yeah, as far as copyright. Yeah, as far, as far as... So I think, you know, for celebrities and things like that off the top of my head, I think you do have protection in the States over your likeness and, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, copyright is still something that is um, pretty important. Uh, I think a lot of us are now catching on to as mm-hmm. far as... You know, we've had, um, for example, an uh, example be, let's say, musicians mm-hmm. who produce songs but were never copyrighted and, and that, mm-hmm. you know, content were used, sample, whatever, but then it was kind of a free-for-all. Uh, how important is it to copyright, you know, your ideas, um, yeah. whether it's your business name, um, yeah. your, your logo and all of that? Um, I think I have a pretty uh, practical approach when it comes to that. I mm-hmm. think a lot of times... One, um, I think it's important to realize that copyright exists the minute that you create something. Okay. So it's not something that has to be registered per se. Okay. Um, a trademark or something like that, you do need to register a trademark. So the name of your business or, or something like that. Um, the, the nice thing, though, I think here, our Bureau of Intellectual Property, there's something called the e-envelope. Yes. And uh, so there you can register your copyright. And um, when that becomes useful is if, if somebody does sample your stuff. and Because and, then you have you know, in court kind of leading evidence, at least that's considered a priority, right, then. So in that case, then a judge will be easier to establish that you were the first person to have, you know, created this. Because then it, that, that, that's when it becomes interesting or when it becomes necessary is the minute that someone actually infringes on your right. Correct. Then you need to, you know, show up in court. And that's the only thing I think that's, uh, it makes, I think, intellectual property um, a bit trickier uh, because, you know, like when you said how important is it, it's important, but... At the same time, if you don't have the money to defend against in- infringement on your right, then it, how much sense does it make to register it? Because mm. you might have a trademark, but if you're going to have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to take somebody to court in order to, you know, get your right, then the question is, you know, a lot of times I tell people, if you're going to spend all the money to register it, then make sure that you have the money also to defend it later. Interesting. But, so, yeah. but it's kind of like, well, um, you can do it, but expect to lose in a sense maybe if 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 you're if you're up against you know if it's a, another a person with a lot more money than yeah, you yeah of course then uh perhaps yeah, yeah. because it's you know it's the, you know i mean of course if you have it registered i think a lot of times you know attorneys will you'll get a cease and desist letter yeah and uh, that doesn't cost you too much money but if the person ignores your cease and desist yeah. then uh, then after that it has to be okay i have to take i have to start a court case and that might be dragged on correct and you know so you you might end up in the right but you know i think it's an important thing to, to weigh when you're thinking about protecting your creations I think uh, looking at you know how how easy is it to enforce it just because you say oh but it's mine mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you're in the right that you it might take you a while to to get that okay yeah here you go mm-hmm. I, I'll stop doing this and have you ever delved into um, data protection uh, I've advised cyber security and here and, and there and on data protection field? I think to uh, I wrote an article on, um, at the time it was the that free harbor, uh, safe harbor, sorry, the safe harbor between, the, it was the, the European judgment and basically how, how we were allowed to share data between the EU and the United States. And then Europe realized that there was actually not a lot of safeguards within the United States with all the leaks and, and, and things like that with yeah. Snowden. And so then they had to clamp down on that legislation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have, that's more about data transfer and the way it happens between um 
the different between the EU and the United States. Um, and in terms of data protection locally, you know, I've advised clients here and there on, on you know, or specifically our data protection laws and how they apply to, to whatever work they're doing and, and making sure that those things are taken into account and in ensuring that they have a, that they're adequately covered. So, gotcha. Yeah. I okay. don't know if that answers your question. I, yeah, it does. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Um, I mean, because I, I ask it because I, I know it's not it's it's something that's not major here per se. Mm-hmm. But of course, uh, as um, yeah, and the world itself is already progressing. But as we progress along yep. with the world, you know, these are eventually discussions that will be commonplace in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. You and know? I think especially if you have some type of presence that touches the rest of the world, Indeed. I think then you want to make sure that you're still adhering to, to legislation that maybe not on a European level, but still that maybe you're taking a little bit extra precaution because yeah, you don't know when too. maybe someone in a different jurisdiction might come after you. Correct. Yeah, so. indeed. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Good afternoon, everybody. and Welcome back to the News Behind the News with Ralph Cantav on Mix 94.7 FM. And this afternoon, I'm joined with Miss Natalie Tackling. And uh, so far, I'm joining this legal discussion. Um, one of the things I am curious about is, uh, you know, here in St. Martin, we do have quite a bit of lawyers. Uh, what was it like for you setting up your own firm? Um, did you find that competition was a little too heavy? You know, finding your own niche within the legal field on the island? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I don't think, um, you know, of course, the act of setting it up uh, is not too difficult. But um, of course, it did take some courage on my part to to decide to finally make that make the leap. Mm-hmm. And um, and when I finally did, you know, now I've you know been doing this since April 2020. And, you know, I have to say that oh, I, don't, I don't regret it. Yeah, I started just <laughs> as we I remember it was like my contract finished with the council. And that was like the 31st of March. And we went right into lockdown wow. and everything. So the, the timing at the time was not great. But, you know, in the end, I think uh, it. this it's all worked out. And and I think you go through kind of growing from there. For me, the added challenge, of course, was, um, you know, the fact that I was coming from a government position. So I wasn't coming from a law firm uh, directly where, you know, a lot of times people take clients with them. And yeah, I got you. So I was, it was kind of building it from, from the ground up. And, um, and I think that's, that's been a really fun and, and interesting experience. And, uh, you know, a lot of the lawyers that I do know, at least, uh, especially a lot of the local lawyers and they've, people are very helpful. And I think we all, as locals especially, um, want to see each other succeed. And, I, you know, I have felt, you know, so a, a bit of camaraderie Embrace. and support, you know, from from other law- lawyers that I know on the island. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, we all try to support each other. And um, so that's that's been actually really nice. Um, I lost my train of thought. So yeah. um, <laughs> yeah, you're basically detailing yeah. what was setting up yourself as yeah. a, your own firm, yeah. you know, getting clients and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, um, of course, you know, being a lawyer, it's um, it's not like... Uh, it's not a regular business that you know you advertise, and, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so there was kind of like, oh, how do I get, how do I get clients? <laughs> but uh, I, I think the more work you do, the the more it comes, and you know, it's it's uh, I think of a business that's really built on your reputation, and and I think yes. that you know, as you know, you need to have you know one client that's really happy with you, and they talk to more people, and then it just keeps keeps going from there. Gotcha. And um, so I've been really excited to just kind of experience uh, the growth of it and as it continues to grow I'm, I'm excited to keep doing it gotcha so, yeah, so well, you know when I think of the legal industry of course scandal comes to mind um, the TV show <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> uh, but, like, but okay. also <laughs> no, sorry, yeah. also Suits, suits? more so Suits yeah. I don't know if you ever watched Suits yeah yeah, yeah I watched Suits uh, um, and so it's nice that you you uh, mentioned that you do get the support uh, from mm. other lawyers yeah. um, here locally uh, and I'm guessing of course Simon has its own it has its bar association uh, Correct. How, how does that really function or is it just a matter of yeah. registering yeah so you're not uh, unlike the netherlands where all attorneys are obligated to be members of the bar here we don't have that obligation in the law oh okay so it's it's actually up to you know the lawyer themselves if they want to be a member of the bar or not um i'm not sure what percentage it is at the moment that that we have of of members versus not members compared to the amount of lawyers uh, working here but you know i think um you know, of course, with the bar, we're kind of the, the talking partner between, you know, different, uh, between the court and, and the legal profession and, I, I follow you. and things like that. Yeah, because I was going to ask, this, this, this may not be very personal, uh, your opinion, but shouldn't it be then that every lawyer law firm is registered with, uh, with the bar? It's been a discussion for years. Um, it's been on the books for, for years to, to happen. I mean, there's also our 
Our national ordinance that regulates the legal profession is also extremely old. And uh, for as long mm. as I've been back here, we've been discussing a new draft. And um, it just, you know, it's kind of like you. those things that, that politically, they kind of never go any further. I think there's... Like, it's kind of up in the air. It, exactly. I think there's been a lot of opinions. There's been a lot of meetings from the bar here and also on Curacao and Aruba and even on the other, on the best islands to discuss this draft. And, um, you know, I think so there is something there. It just, for some reason, it never yes. goes any, any yeah. further. Yeah. Um, maybe not as important. <laughs> to the, on, on, not on, you know, it's not, I can imagine and, uh, that it's not something that's high on a, on a political high agenda. I follow you. Yeah, because... Um, but in, in that draft, there there was talk about, okay, will we then make it, you know, uh, mandatory for everybody to have to be registered? Yeah, so. indeed. Because, uh, yeah, what comes to mind um, then basically is that is something you tend to hear regarding certain things and you wonder, well, you know, how set back are we from old legislation and and, would, and looking at even, well, yeah, looking at your, your, your current practice or even your time um, in, at other firms, do you mm -hmm. find that, you know, we are indeed hampered by, by old laws? Mm. I mean, I think a lot of times looking at our legislation, it can be modernized. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are, we do tend to be, you know, behind on, on developments in the Netherlands, which I think could be a good and a bad thing because it might be that there was a certain legal development there that didn't end up working out. Yeah. And, and you still and have your own identity. Yeah. You don't want to just and, But, you know, at the everything. same time, they can be a guinea pig for their own ideas. Yeah, yeah. And we implement what works. But, um... Uh, but yes, yes and no, you know. So um, I do think there's a lot of things in place and a lot of older legislation that you read it, you go through it. It's just a little bit difficult to understand. It might not be very flexible. And you do see an opportunity to kind of to modernize that, that legislation. But it, but this, the, the point is, is that was there works. You know, I think, yes, we would be hampered if the whatever was there just didn't work. I think um, I that's you. the difference. Okay. All right. And... Um, you know, now that you have a year and change in the game uh, with your <laughs> own practice, mm -hmm. uh, what are the main issues you've noticed people would come to you to, to, to help them solve? Ooh, that's a, or is it all over the place? That's, that's a tough one. It is, um, it is different, uh, you know, because I think for now it's also been a lot of uh, referrals with working with certain clients. You're okay. kind of getting the same type of work in a little bit. If, um, you know, a lot of corporate clients are, are talking to one another, then you're doing a lot of corporate advising. Or, or for me, I've been doing a lot of legislation, a lot of advising on, on, on legislation. So it's not so much that I'm dealing with um, with someone walking in off the street. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then, of course, with, you know, working with, with the legal desk and looking at the problems there, you get, that's, of course, a completely different than anything I deal with um, in my own practice. So... In that sense, just being really more social aid, uh, legal aid, then you really get people with, you know, all types of like, questions that, that I, I never had you. to deal with, even as, in, as a practicing attorney in different firms, uh, just because they're so unique, I think, to, to their, um, to where they live and to their environment. And, um, and because there's no threshold anymore for you to come to a lawyer. So sometimes questions aren't even really legal. Mm, I see. So th and that's that's really just the Saba project. That's, that's something very different than than my own practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I wanted yeah. to touch on that. Yeah, which so is, um, we don't want to. Uh, can you give us a the, yeah? Can you give us a history of that and how that came about? Mm -hmm. um, the Saba Legal Aid Desk. Yep. Yeah, so that was actually an initiative between the government of Saba and um, and the Ministry of BZK in Holland, and um, so I think that they re they had an idea in Saba within their government that. The locals there, they have no access to, to lawyers. There's no lawyers locally. Even the court comes, you know, once a month. Every so often the notary flies in, the bailiff flies in. So for them, the threshold to, to seek legal aid was, was very, very high. And in that sense, they came up with this idea of, you know, let's ha have a pilot and have this legal aid desk. And, um, and then have at least that someone comes over and that people can email, they can call. And that we had kind of lower that threshold. So I was part of, you know, setting that up and uh, I'm lucky enough to, to still be working with them, you know, in a second year of the project and we're hoping to make it more structural going forward. So that would be great. And, or maybe even expand it. So we're, there's... How has it been, um, you know, handling the cases from over there? It's been, with COVID, it's been a bit, a bit yeah. tougher. Um, luckily, I think I go in a week and a half. So that's, that's nice again. Um, but this year has been a little bit more difficult in terms of, of going over there and having a physical presence. But, you know, we've been doing things on Zoom or, or what have you, or calls or email. And that works okay. But of course, um, the visibility is, is nice too. So, but we've, we've adapted, I think, to, uh, 
to, to COVID and, and everything that that's brought with it. Mm -hmm. Considering the, the times that you, you had to go to court, Mm -hmm. um, what, 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 what were the elements you know, that, made a, that made a case most challenging? That's a, that's a tough question. I um, haven't litigated a ton. It's not it's something I, I don't like it as much. No, okay. I, I do oh. like it, but um, you know, I, ended, I did a litigation in my first year with, with uh, the first firm I was with, and then after that I did more of a corporate background. And now, of course, my firm now, we do do litigation for clients. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it what makes it challenging in that sense i think it really depends probably on the subject matter i think actually for me um i will say the most challenging case i had that i had to do in court was also just in why i no longer really do things like that but i in my first year you kind of get and you do everything because you're also you're 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 being trained yeah as an attorney and um i had to do a divorce case that you know was yeah i think it was you know the it, they were fighting over their child and and for me then, I felt that to be very difficult because yeah. I just, I thought it was too highly emotionally charged. And um, and you see people get very um, irrational, I think, in, in, in situations like that as well. Mm -hmm. So I have to say for me then, because a lot of times I think as an attorney, it's easy to, to keep your emotions out of the case that you're doing. Especially, you know, if it's civil litigation, it's usually something that's pretty straightforward in terms of it's really you're debating legal issues and, you know, who has a different interpretation of it or who has the better interpretation of it or the more convincing one. And I think that that's, it's fairly easy then to keep emotions out of that. So for me then, what I thought then in, court, in terms of being in court <laughs> where it was difficult was, was when, it, when it does have to do with, with people's lives and um, with, with, with children and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm curious of, you know, talking to various young professionals is mm -hmm. always uh, what is it like having to deal with, you know, the current corporate culture, you could say, you know, of the island um, and ways that we can improve it, you know, make make some changes, but also even learn. Um, but especially given that, you know, you're a lawyer, uh, what can you say about that? And, and also um, the ways in which people seek you know, you and um, seek seek you to to help uh, execute whether it's uh, proposals, negotiations, and deals. Mm -hmm. um, our corporate culture, in what sense? Um, a sense as, uh, I guess, I would say, general professionalism. Mm -hmm. Tough, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that then it becomes not even so much as a lawyer, but I think though it becomes a more interesting question just as a business owner. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you experience, you know, what, what goes on? And I think that then in that sense, yes, I, th I think there's a lot of things to be said and probably in conversations I have with other, you know, young professionals or if you own a business, things like our, our, tax, our taxation system, you know, or even, you know, things as the fact that some things are so cumbersome to do and mm -hmm. they take so much time, you know, the fact that you can pay your turnover tax online, but you still have to physically take the form into the tax office every month. You know, I think those things like that, I think, hamper uh, our doing business and entrepreneurship a little bit, or even uh, the conversation we just had before about online, you know, <laughs> some, and me needing to send an oh, online yeah, payment. Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, but that has nothing to do with being yeah, a business owner, you. but it's that, just, but it's, it's, it, uh, I think extent, it affects everybody. Yeah, it correct. affects businesses, it affects individuals. Um I, I, I don't know too much about, you know, how I would experience the cor corporate culture. Um, I do feel like we have more and more young professionals, and I think that that's, that's refreshing. But I also think we have a lot to, that we can learn, too, from, from the older folk, if they're Correct. willing to teach us. Yeah. And um, so I don't know that I could speak too much about uh, how I experience the corporate culture. Otherwise, I do think that in a lot of businesses and a lot of the way that we do things, things can be more digital or they could be more streamlined or more efficient. But that's, I think, a general thing on the island that we're slowly, maybe, hopefully working towards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking of slowly work, uh, slowly <laughs> towards working <laughs> on stuff, uh, one thing that comes to mind is um, uh, what you said uh, just a while ago as far as um, emotions and, and my cases are concerned. Mm -hmm. Because I could imagine uh, the mental pressure that comes with, with the work that you do. Um, and so how do you, you know, prioritize and what is your mental health? Goal strategy, <laughs> like you know, as far as you know, de-stressing from yeah, yeah, the work that you do and mm -hmm. um, unplugging. Yeah, um, I'm I'm pretty physically active, mm -hmm. so for me that really helps. You know, I, I you know I either you know do CrossFit or I play tennis, or I, for me I really enjoy being out on the water. Gotcha. Um, if I can get on a boat, that's great. And I've recently been getting into wakeboarding with, and uh, so I think that that's that's fun. Those cool. are really cool things. I think that help you kind of de-stress or. So for me, that that being 
physically active has really helped. But I also make it a priority on before, like every Saturday night. I make sure that, you know, with my girlfriends that we, that I go out, that's like our girls night. And uh, so we make sure to do that. And, you know, I think things like that are important because you also look forward to them. You know, so at least for, for me, that that helps, you know, to be sure to just go out and unwind and relax. And you can't be, you know, it's not healthy for you to work all the mm. time. And, Indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, burnout is burnout is real, it's, and, and you don't want to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know people that. that have had burnouts, and it's not fun, and it's not fun to see someone go through it. It's yeah. not. It's hard to recover from. Mm -hmm. And so, absolutely, I think it's really important to to have your boundaries. And but you know, it's hard when you get stuck in the middle of it. But um, but I think that's why it's like really important to always make sure to prioritize yourself, even if you don't. Like a lot of times, I think we feel guilty about it. And um, there's this guilt of or this idea that we need to be doing more or, not, or you feel bad because, you know, you left the office early or something like that. But at the end of the day, I think it's it's very important that you do it. Yeah. And uh, and I mean, I went through a lot, even professionally, going through periods where you didn't give yourself that break. And now, you know, I look back and, I'm, and I realize how important it is to, to make sure that you have a healthy balance in, in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's something that came to mind as far as factors, uh, things in our community that still kind of intimidate people, um, that make people feel uneasy. Those are usually conversations about money, um, taxes, mm -hmm. anything to kind of deal with black and white, you know? Um, and one of those things too is, is, is in the law, um, mm -hmm. our legal system. I think that definitely more can be done for people to understand or even even if it's just understand the process of how to access, um, you know, the laws that govern our land. Uh, this may be kind of broad, but, um, as, you know, what, what do you think can be done to help people better understand our uh, legal system? And I think perhaps maybe the one of the barriers may be the fact that it's primarily in Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's absolutely important. I think educating the population is, is really important. And uh, I've... Uh, I've had, you know, I had co coincidentally a conversation last week, I think, with a mutual friend of both of us about, uh, you know, kind of how can we go about educating our, our population, even things like our the way our electoral process works, the mm -hmm. way our legislative process works, you know, and but I think more importantly than too, it becomes most people aren't, I think, aren't going to access the law and try to understand it. But you can, I think, um, break down what how, what it means for them in a different way that's more accessible, mm. you know, in terms of, you know, should we have a, a website uh, from the tax department that you can go on there and, you know, kind of have FAQs or click through something that's that's relevant to you to understand what the implications are of not filing or, you know, things like that. Um, absolutely, you know, or even um, maybe something even so simple as... Uh, in terms of the ordinance regulating the, the cars, you know, or, or the, that they, that you're, you need to have these lights working, or or this or that. Um, so it, it, then it, it does become like how much of it is really relevant to the to the general population, and I, and then I believe that we should arm them with that information, gotcha. maybe through the specific source where it affects them. Gotcha. Okay, um, that, that's a that's a very good thought, yeah. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that come to mind um, ev is even um, as far as the police, mm -hmm. you know. Um, because there are, there are several things that people don't care of. You know, if a police stops you, then what exactly do you say? What rights do yeah. you have? What are the basic things that, yeah. you, that you can um, yeah, for sure. use to defend yourself at yeah. least? Because I don't know or just if... just have an understanding of... Yeah, for yeah, sure. Because right I, I don't know how, how much it matters if legislation was in English, you know, because uh, let's just say it was all in English. You know, what is the likelihood that the average person would, <laughs> would, go, on to the, uh, would go on the internet and go read, you know, the entire ordinance? You know, even our constitution, you can find it up there in English. There's quite yes, a bit yes, of the yes, organic English, legislation that's yeah. that's been um, translated into English. But I wonder uh, how many people actually go and, and, and look for it. I think it's very much when something happens to you, then you want to know what the effect of something is. Mm. And, um, that's a good point. And in that sense, I think then it's good to have the information accessible then in, in for them. If you do have a question, that you can go and find that information. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, one of the final things I'd like to end off with is, uh, you know, recently you were, um, wait, you were appointed to the APS board. Um, yeah. Congratulations Thank on you. that. And uh, basically, you know, um, again, as a young professional, you know, you now have an opportunity to establish yourself yeah, career-wise, um, be part of initiatives uh, that help the country. Uh, so, what is your take as far as, um, you know, persons committing to 
different ways, whether professionally or mm-hmm. even if it's a service group and stuff, yeah. um, give back to give back to the island. Uh, I, I mean, for me, I've, I've always done, you know, s- some type of extracurricular work. You know, growing up, I was part of the Leo Club in high school. And um, after that, uh, together with someone else, we actually worked two of the founding members of, I think now they have the Omega Leo Club. Um, I didn't stay there very long, but, you know, I've always done, you know, multiple different things. And now it's it's nice to to have these, you know, professional extracurriculars as well that I'm able to, to give back. And I think that that's it, that it's always great to, to give back to the country. And for me, I think it's really important. And you just you make the time for those things. And I, and I think at the same time, they are great learning experiences. I'm really excited to be uh, on board with APS now. And I've already learned so much in, in the short amount of time that I've been there. And I think that that's great for your, you know, for, for, for the island, but it's great for your for, for your own professional growth, for your own, you know, um, not only professionally, I'm also for my per- personally, I'm learning so much as well. Mm-hmm. And I think anything that we can do to, to, to try to give back, that it's so immensely important. And being, I think most of us, we should try to, I think, do more with service clubs and not just wait for the two days for SXM Dut, but maybe look for different ways that you can give back within your, within your community or, or to the island as a whole. Because I think there's, there's so much need and there's so much that can be done. And um, I absolutely encourage it. <laughs> Great. Uh, any final words from you? No, that's, uh, I mean, thanks, <laughs> thanks for having okay. me. Thanks for having me on your show. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you coming yeah. on as well. I hope I didn't uh, stretch you too much with, <laughs> with, with, with all these questions. No, 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 no. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so to our viewers and listeners, uh, this was a conversation with Miss Natalie Tackling. And uh, be sure to tune in to the next program tomorrow. Do take care and thank you so much for tuning in.